All right, listeners, I think you know that we are part of the Radiotopia Network, which is basically a network built on the idea that you should support the most creative, independent audio makers around. No one, and I mean no one, embodies the Radiotopia ethos more than Benjamin Walker and his show, Theory of Everything. Benjamin, who I've known for a long time, has been making beautiful, personal, sprawling audio documentaries for decades that help us understand the very strange world we live in. And now he has a new series called Not All Propaganda is Art. The new series goes back to the 1950s when Western security agencies like the CIA paid artists, writers, and intellectuals to fight the cultural Cold War. The CIA funds were free. I mean, no one was told what to say. Gloria Steinem, activist who sees the CIA as a sort of enlightened pal or rich uncle, there is another viewpoint. Look, if you're listening to this show, I know you like secret histories. I know you like a mix of culture and politics and shadowy figures. So what are you waiting for? Not All Propaganda is Art from Benjamin Walker. You can find it now wherever you listen or at theoryofeverythingpodcast.com. Hey everyone, Jody Avergan here. It is October of an even-numbered year, which means that our minds turn to the election in early November. All this month, we are going to be doing special episodes still about history, but ones that feel like they might speak to the run-up to this year's very important election. This week, we're going to re-air a few of our favorites, and then we're going to do special theme weeks on polling, referendums, midterm elections, right up to Election Day. So that's the plan. Happy October. Here we go with one of our favorite midterm related stories from the archives. Hello and welcome to This Day in Esoteric Political History from Radiotopia. My name is Jody Avergan. This day, September 27th, 1994, 367 Republicans in the U.S. Congress stood on the steps of Congress and signed the Contract with America. It was written by Newt Gingrich and Dick Armey. The contract detailed the actions that Republicans promised to take if they became the majority party in the United States House of Representatives that fall, um, and that would have been the first time in 40 years. I will spoil it and say that they did. The contract included 10 bullet points with items like And you'll recognize this language, fiscal responsibility, quote, taking back our streets, common sense, legal reforms. That fall, the Republicans won a net of 54 seats, took control of the House. They also took control of the Senate. And President Clinton was now faced with stiff opposition. Republicans had their groove back. Gingrich as well really became a rising star in the party and in many ways the voice of the new Republican Party. So let's talk about the contract with America and its legacy. I am joined, as always, by Nicole Hemmer of Columbia. Hello, Nikki. Hello, Jody. And back with us is Kristen Soltis Anderson, pollster at Echelon Insights and author of The Selfie Vote. Hello, Kristen. Hello. Yeah, so the contract with America, you're absolutely right that it turned Newt Gingrich into a national leader. Um, And it was something that he had been engineering for years while in the Congress, trying to figure out some way to get Republicans back in power. What's so surprising about this, actually, is that Gingrich had been working for so long to try to to figure out a way for Republicans to win. But the contract with America doesn't come out until late September of election year. I mean, Kristen, is there a reason why this comes out what seems like so late in the election cycle? Well, I wonder to what extent the idea of this being so late in the election cycle is, is more about the relative length of our current election yeah. cycle. <laughs> Fair. But nowadays, it feels like we are already seeing the 2024 Republican primary for president underway. Uh, and the 2020 election hasn't even happened. And so we're so used to nowadays these unbelievably prolonged political cycles. But the reality is also that most of your swing voters are living their lives and are not tuning into this in a very intensive way until closer to election day when the decision is closer in front of them. So I think seen through that lens, I am less surprised by the idea of rolling something out in September before an election. Um, if, if you're doing it at a moment and people may actually be the most primed to be paying attention yeah. and be in a decision making kind of mode. So when you said uh, 2024 presidential primary, I heard liquor cabinets all over America starting to creak open as our listeners reached for. Um, but, but, but on this timing question, Kristen, because I think this is really fascinating to me. I think it's a good reminder about the sort of when people start to pay attention, particularly back then when I think there wasn't as much just sort of attention flying around. Um, but 
does it indicate anything that the contract with America was in some way kind of like, was it like coalescing and like picking up momentum or did it really like create momentum that put Republicans over the top? I think it's the sort of thing that gives people a reason to vote for you. And that's unusual in this day and age uh, and and frankly for quite some time that it's it's very easy to campaign against something the campaign against something is very easy and so the contract with america takes a risk that a lot of political uh candidates nowadays in campaigns you know most campaign managers and operatives do not tell you to go out on a limb and put out a big bold policy agenda because it just creates a target for your opponent to shoot at um but in in this case they they did it and i think it created additional momentum that helped i don't think it was just riding an existing wave i mean we do know that that for the most part whenever there's the out party in that first midterm of a new presidency they they tend to do better Mm -hmm. um so there may have been some of that that momentum going on but i do think that the contract with america was just so different than what we're used to seeing on so many different levels that you have to credit it with with pushing republicans um to a next level of being able to pick up seats Yeah. And the real novelty here is that it's happening for a midterm election. I mean, thinking about voting for somebody in the 5th District of Virginia for the same reason you're voting for somebody from the 10th District in California, like that's pretty novel. So voting against Clinton, which is what about that, like, backlash that happens um, in the first midterm is all about, that's enough to get you some seats. But if you want to get into the majority, and there were a lot of seats they had to pick up in order to get into the majority, you had to add something else. And this was that kind of novel gimmick in a lot of ways, but this novel idea that would get everyone kind of on the same page. Right. I mean, just that show of unity of having literally everyone who was up for election standing there together is just remarkable. I mean, we can talk about whether we would ever see something like that again (laughs) today. Um, But, you know, is it at all surprising, Nikki, you mentioned a little, uh, you know, Gingrich's path to this. But Kristen, can you put can you give us a sense of who Gingrich is at this point and why he's the one to coalesce? I mean, you know, in the way that Nikki just described, like when you often it's the top of a ticket that is able to sort of say, this is what our party is all about. And instead we have this congressman from Georgia. Yeah, I think in the in the aftermath of 1992, George H.W. Bush has been ousted from office after just one term, not a terribly popular person. And so there's a vacuum of leadership um, of what does it mean to be a Republican in a post George H.W. Bush world that that and that, you know, Newt Gingrich as a professor and student of history understands that this is an opportunity for this void to be filled and for him to view the party as a blank piece of paper on which he can uh, plot out the future. And and the other thing to remember about Newt is he's very into planning. Um, yeah. I, I may just be saying this because for eight years I worked for his former director of planning, a man named David Winston, who, who was very close with him during his time in the House. Um, and so I always get to hear all of these great, you know, Newt stories um, about what it was like working for him. But he's just someone who's always thinking trying to think six steps ahead and trying to think about what can history tell us about this moment. And uh, I I think it just made him sort of a a uniquely suited figure to be the one to step up in that moment and say, I'm going to take charge now. It's interesting, right, that given this blank slate for defining what the party is going to look like, he picks the issues that he picks for the contract with America, because a lot of them are about government reform. It's like um, make it harder to raise taxes, um, make there be more ethical standards, um, these kinds of good government reform policies that he's really picking up less from the Republican Party and more from Ross Perot and his run in 1992. He's trying to attract those Perot voters, Mm -hmm. and he's not putting on the table issues like abortion issues like gay rights. Like he's not touching those culture war issues. He's picking what pollster Frank Luntz called these 60 percent issues that he claimed had 60 percent public support. Oh. Um, that's not really the case. Right. But this is yeah. this is exactly you know what, what I think we should get into here. And I want to just give some context for that. So, so we'll talk about Frank Luntz and another big figure here and the sort of pollster driven nature of this. But yeah, so it was ostensibly and a lot of the reporting at the time talked about how these issues were ones that they had found were at least there was apparently a threshold. 60% of Americans need to support something if it's going to make its way onto this list. Uh, Nikki, do you want to 
Do you want to put a finer point on your skepticism (laughs) of that? And then, Kristen, you can jump in. Sure, sure. Um, So this was a play for sort of a a populist agenda, right? These must be things that the, the majority of Americans believe in. Frank Luntz would never release his polling data, um, even though it was standard practice to release that data in order to have some transparency and some checking. And he ultimately is sanctioned by the polling industry for not sort of being transparent about his data with this. From what he says, he also wasn't necessarily polling the issues. He was polling the language with which the issues were being put forward. So he was trying to figure out how to frame the issues so that they sounded more popular than maybe the underlying issue was. Yeah, you know, I'll be honest, that's how I kind of think of Frank Luntz. I mean, he's an incredibly influential figure in Republican politics, in politics in general. But I think of him less as a quote unquote pollster and more as someone who has a real knack for talking to voters and getting a sense of the language and the framing of issues that really works in modern politics. Um, Kristen, you know, what's your sense of Frank Luntz's role in this story where he does get a lot of credit for helping craft the contract with America? And I guess his larger place in the story of the new era of of Republican parties that emerged throughout the 90s. This is uh, something that I encountered um, in a book that I read, Ed Gillespie's political memoir, Winning Right, from <laughs> 2006, which I, I, I believe I have a copy of because I was, you know, 20... Two, and this was like the first book event I'd ever been to in D.C. Uh-huh. And I was just so excited and um, read it cover to cover. But, you know, like most political memoirs, it's relatively stayed and, you know, not not terribly, except for on page 45, where he starts spilling the tea on Frank Luntz and he <laughs> does not hold back. Gillespie talks about reaching out to Frank Luntz, who had done polling for Ross Perot, and quote, I didn't know it then, but I was helping to create a media monster. He then goes on and says, Frank would later conduct one of the focus groups testing the contract with America. He used that single task to essentially claim credit for his creation and made a fortune selling politicians across the world on the idea. It's unfortunate a lot of people did a lot more work and had a lot more to do with its conception and development than Frank did. So... In an otherwise relatively, you know, uh, Mm -hmm. mild-mannered political memoir, tell us how you really feel, Ed Gillespie. (laughs) This is a big point of controversy is, you know, who gets to take credit? Because anytime something succeeds, and obviously the contract with America was clearly successful for Republicans, um, everybody wants to take credit for it. But obviously there are some who would dissent from the overarching public narrative around the birth and the origin story of the contract. But also it's kind of like, uh, what would you expect from Frank Luntz, a person who says, I can help you perfectly spin things into a really compelling story than him perfectly spinning his role in this into a very compelling story. So it's kind of like proof of how good he is at this. Um, He did one poll and he kind of gets all the credit. But one thing that I would push back on about the whole idea that, oh, you just need the right language. Like it is Mm -hmm. true. Uh, Frank Luntz has been incredibly successful by building an empire around the idea that you just need the right words and phrases and people will gravitate to you. And I'll talk about things like, oh, the death tax versus the estate tax, et cetera. But ultimately, you need an underlying piece of substance that people will gravitate to. So a lot of these, as you mentioned, kind of good government reform type things, they they work not just because you put the right words on them, but because a lot of independent minded people said, I think that government's not working very well. Um, I would like to see it reform. So you need at some point a level of substance underneath it to make it work. And and I really feel like in, you know, I've now worked in the polling world for 15 years. I will have clients constantly telling me, well, we really just need the right words and phrases. And I'm like, yes, you do need the right words and, and you need the right underlying policy and belief and value that connects with people in order for it to work. You can't sell someone something that they really don't like or that contradicts with their their core values or that they think is broken um, just because you pick the right fuzzy mascot or fancy word. Yeah. And I think it's so important to just underline how up in the air politics were in 1994. I, I mm-hmm. think that we've lost sight of what a shockwave Ross Perot was to the political system. He got one of the biggest third party votes in American political history. Like this was a huge moment. Um, and both parties were trying to figure out how do we, how do we get us that Perot vote? And there really was this desire for 
reform, for doing something about the way that government worked and the contract with America, even if the specific issues weren't all really 60 percent issues, were tapping into that underlying discontent. Well, Jody, one thing that you, you also mentioned was the idea of it's hard to imagine, you know, 300 plus Republicans all, you know, standing arm in arm, agreeing on something like this these days. And I, I think the closest uh, example to this, which it was not anywhere on the scale of the contract with America, um, but Dave Winston, you know, who I, I mentioned I'd worked for, he wound up being a big advisor to Boehner. And so there's a lot of debate about the 2010 midterms and to what extent, you know, you had this Tea Party energy. And was that what pushed Republicans over the top? Was it the fact that, hey, it's just the first midterm of a new president? And so Republicans were getting the pendulum swinging back from Obama. But there was also, I mean, Boehner rolled out a sort of diet contract with America, the pledge yeah. to America that year. Um, and, you know, I, I don't know to what extent your average voter heard about it in the same way that they may have heard about a contract with America in 1994. But there have been attempts to kind of revive it and try it again as recently as 10 years ago. Right. Yeah. And I will say, I mean, I think a lot about the Tea Party a lot uh, when thinking about this story. And it's a reminder that these moments where things feel like they coalesce for a party, they often come right at moments when things can feel most fractured. And it's like, if you don't pull it off, you really don't pull it off. Everything falls apart. And I think the Tea Party was the same sort of thing. It was it was at the same time new energy for the Republican Party, but also a real threat to the Republican Party, uh, to its unity from within. Uh, I wonder if we can talk about some other legacies here. I mean, there's kind of on two fronts I'm thinking about. One is there's the legacy of just the policy issues that were in these 10 bullet points. Uh, you know, we have term limits in there. I think there was a three-fifths majority to vote on tax increases, all sorts of other reforms. Were those reforms actually implemented? And then I guess there's the larger question of just kind of the nature of politics and how much the contract with America signaled a new way that politics happens within the Republican Party and in general. But Nikki, do you want to start with the reforms themselves? I mean, very few of them actually got implemented, right? So they passed the House. The House does its job, but most of them don't get passed by the Senate or they don't get signed into law by the president or they get overturned eventually by the Supreme Court. So many of these don't go into effect. And... Also, you know, eventually a lot of these are focused on reform and ethics. Gingrich himself gets pulled up on ethics charges and eventually pushed out of the speakership fairly, um, fairly early on. So you see some of these like go into effect on the state level. Um, so that three fifths majority on tax increases, that was something that went into law in a place like California. But these don't become national governing rules because of those limitations on implementing them. And a lot of the governmental reforms that were being proposed, you know, if you think about the way that Congress has changed over the years, you know, through understandable um, desires on the part of voters, you've seen things like Congress is very reluctant to increase its own pay or certainly pay for staffers. You've seen less and less congressional staff in, in many offices uh, and, you know, as well as the politics of, you know, committees and committee assignments and all of that. And you now have this this situation where, you know, arguably some of the things that are done to make government better, like let's have one of the things that was part of the, the contract was let's make committee meetings be open to the public, right? That, um, that that there was this push for let's put things on TV. And Gingrich was great at, you know, using C-SPAN to his advantage of knowing, look, I'm going to be on the House floor. Nobody's going to be here listening to me, but I can make my points and I'm creating these video clips of me fighting, um, fighting for what I believe in. But, you know, you could argue that some of these things that even may have been done with good intentions have negative effects that now, you know, most debate that takes place in, on the House floor is done for show is not actually an exchange of ideas um, that you have nowadays. Uh, th their congressional pay is quite low. And so the only folks who can take a lot of these staff jobs are folks that are independently wealthy are supported by their parents or folks who stay very, very short time and then leave to go become lobbyists. And so you have the brain drain of um, policy and knowledge that goes out to private industry to make a little more money. And so these are the sorts of things that lead to Congress being somewhat less functional, even if they were things that are done with very good intentions in mind. Yeah, there was a piece a couple of years ago, I think, called In Defense of Corruption or something like that, which basically said, like, look, corruption and backroom deals is kind of how you get things done. And all of this, like, good government ethics 
effort has made it a lot harder to actually govern. I'm not endorsing it, but I'm throwing it out there as an interesting argument worth looking at. So final question, I, you know, I did mention in the intro that it had been 40 years since there was real Republican power. This obviously, as we've been discussing, marks a real resurgence for Republicans. But Kristen, can you just kind of take a step back and give us a sense of what is the new Republican Party that comes onto the scene in the wake of the contract and the big midterm win uh, that fall? So, I mean, the, the Republican Party that comes on the scene in the wake of the contract, in my view, is... You see things like fiscal conservatism really trying to come to the forefront. I believe this was during the time when you had Bill Clinton say the era of big government is dead. Um, this was the, the idea of big versus small government. A lot of you know strains borrowed from from the Reagan era um, really become baked in into this party that you know it's it, it hangs on to its and, and then again it becomes very defined later by the impeachment of Bill Clinton, uh, which they gamble incorrectly is going to politically help them. And it winds up actually Democrats pick up seats in 1998 and Gunger has stepped down as speaker. So, you know, in some ways, the excitement and sense of momentum from 1994, uh, it, it led Republicans to overreach and then cost Gingers to speakership four years later. And also on a cellular level, though, it's it's changing the Republican Party. If you look at the makeup of the mm-hmm. Republican caucus, it becomes much more conservative. And it sort yeah. of completes a process that had been underway for 20 or 30 years of um, purging liberal and moderate Republicans and making it a more conservative party. That switch is pretty much effective in 1994 with the contract with America and that landslide election. Um Okay, that brings us to the end of the episode. So, Nicole Hammer, thank you, as always. Thanks, Jody. And Kristen Soltis-Anderson, thanks to you. Thanks for doing these last two episodes. Those were really fun. Of course. Thank you so much for having me. And you should check out Kristen's work as a pollster with Echelon Insights and also on Twitter, where she posts a picture of her very cute dog, Wally, each and every day. Much needed Twitter content. And, of course, go check out her book, The Selfie Vote. This Day in Esoteric Political History is a proud member of Radiotopia from PRX. Our researcher and producer is Jacob Feldman. Jacob is our producer alongside Brittany Brown. A quick shout out, as we sometimes do to everyone who is leaving ratings and reviews. Those really help others discover the show or just tell someone about the show. Word of mouth is huge for growing the show. So thank you to everyone who has left a rating or a review or spread the word. You can reach out to us if you have anything to say about the show. Email us thisdaypod at gmail.com or find us on social media at thisdaypod on Twitter and Instagram. My name is Jody Avergan. Thanks again for listening and we'll see you soon. We're here because we are taking the first steps and we're taking them in a contract with the American people. Every item in our contract is supported by 60% or more of the American people. And outside Washington, this is a contract with Americans for America. Radio Tokyo.